Hey everyone, this is Nick and this is your Linux and open source news fix for the end of January 2022. Also, starting February the 10th, these videos will become weekly. So this is the last super long format Linux news videos that you're going to see on this channel. The next ones will be shorter, but sweeter and more up to date. So subscribe if you want to see these new videos. This time around, we have more details about GNOME 42. We have Lutris becoming the ultimate game launcher with Ubisoft and Origin support. And we have more mockups about System76 revamp of their cosmic desktop. What we also have is a sponsor. Linode is an amazing way to get your Linux server up and running. They've been voted top provider for infrastructure as a service by G2 and Trustradius, and they offer tons of one-click deployable servers. For example, Owncast, letting you run your own Twitch-like streaming server with video broadcast and chat capabilities or Apache Guacamole, which is the easiest way to get your own fully featured Linux desktop in the cloud, accessible from anywhere in the world. If you prefer gaming, you can also start your own Valheim server on Linode, and they also have one-click servers available for CSGO, Rust, Arc, or Minecraft, among others. Now, on top of that, Linode is currently upgrading all their data centers with faster NVMe block storage, which means that every server that you currently have with them or that you plan to open with them will have access to that faster storage at no extra cost for you, which is pretty freaking amazing. Now, I personally run my own Nextcloud instance and only Office document server, both on Linode, and I couldn't be more satisfied. I can only recommend them. So if you want to give them a shot and get started, click the link in the description below and you will get a free $100 credit to start your own Linux server. So let's begin with the Linux news. And as Linux popularity grows, especially in the server and Internet of Things market, it seems that ill-intentioned people, also known as bastards in technical jargon, are also taking notice. The number of malware targeting Linux has grown 35% in 2021. Most of these seem to be botnets trying to recruit IoT devices into their network to execute massive death by denial of service attacks or DDoS. These botnets have cute names such as XOR DDoS, Mirai, and Modzi, that later one having 10 times more activity in 2021 than in 2020. So, while Linux is generally regarded as a very safe and secure operating system, it can also be infected, so be wary where you install your software from. A first alpha of GNOME 42 has been released, carrying with it an enormous number of changes, as it's the first release where we'll see a bunch of apps ported to GDK4 and using libadvita, which means that these apps will also look different from the current Advaita theme that exists for GDK3 apps, which is either a good thing or a bad thing depending on which side of the issue you're on. You can also expect these horrendous beige folder icons to finally sport colors, or support for the dark mode preference, which should make apps from various desktops behave more consistently when using dark mode. The default apps also get a bunch of new features. The on-screen display that pops up when changing the volume or the brightness will also get a revamp to be less in your face. You can try all these changes using a nightly build of GNOME OS, but keep in mind that it's neither ready to be installed on real hardware, nor ready enough for daily use. I, for one, I'm pretty excited about seeing a fully realized GNOME platform. And of course, I'll cover GNOME 42 in a dedicated video, so subscribe if you want to see that in the future. More interesting GNOME news, as the GNOME Foundation detailed plans to improve some core parts of the experience, including FlatHub, GNOME Software, and GTK4. Turns out the GNOME project is pretty frugal, as they have some leftover money from an endless network grant, and they plan to put that money to good use. The projects that will benefit from this are FlatHub, which should get a way to get verified apps, so people can know if the app has been uploaded by its original developer, as well as setting up an open source only remote for people who really don't want to even see any proprietary stuff in their software centers. GNOME software will also see some work towards supporting progressive web apps or PWAs, and improvements will be made to Libadvita to add whatever didn't make the cut for the first release. Now, if you don't like vanilla GNOME, but you liked Pop OS's spin on it, you're gonna like this. Some mockups of Cosmic have surfaced. Cosmic is the new desktop environment that System76 is working on for Pop! OS, in addition to being the name of their current spin on GNOME. The new model, though, will apparently have dedicated indicators for each system function, like sound, notifications, or calendar, and will offer some amount of choice through a settings panel. That should at least let users move these various indicators around or embed media controls in the top panel, for example. 
It's still very early, but these mockups seem to indicate that Cosmic will have a bunch of options to make it your own, if that's what you're looking for. Moving on to the open source news, and if you never wanted to fork the cache for a Wii U, which is understandable as I had one and I played it for 20 hours tops, you'll be happy to know that CMU, the Wii U emulator, plans to offer support for Linux and to go open source as well. These two items appeared on their official roadmap and are planned for 2022, with the Linux port already in motion. CMU is currently only available on Windows, but it already allows people to play about 50% of the Wii U's game library, which admittedly isn't that huge. The other 50% are either not playable at all, or are able to load but not run, or run but with major bugs. Now more details emerged about KDE's 15 minute bug initiative, which doesn't seem to mean bugs that you can fix in 15 minutes, but more bugs that a user might encounter in their first 15 minutes with KDE. As Nate Graham describes it, KDE often gets the reputation of being buggy, because it still has a number of minor issues that taken individually don't really matter, but added up, they start to really make the experience feel like it's not polished. These bugs, if experienced in your first 15 minutes of usage, might make you run away with a bad first opinion, and the goal here is to fix them. There are already 83 bugs marked with that label, with stuff ranging from there are black dots in the corners of dialog windows to my desktop icons are scrambled after a reboot. And that serves you right for using these murderous little icons. Now let's move on to the applications. Only Office 7 has seen a new release with an interesting new feature that lets you open each app independently. Previously, you had to use tabs in the interface which grouped text documents, spreadsheets, and presentations. Now you can open each in their own window, although they are still grouped in the same application icon and you can create shortcuts for individual programs. You also get 125% and 175% scaling options, pressing Alt will display keyboard shortcuts, and you get a complete dark mode. You can also password protect your documents or create fillable forms in documents to export them as PDFs. If you're not a fan of the vanilla GNOME experience and you prefer to sprinkle it with a few extensions, the new extensions app also got a new release. It's available on Flathub and not only does it list your installed extensions and lets you configure them, but it now lets you completely enable or disable all extensions at once with a single toggle. It separates your extensions that you installed from the system extensions and you can browse additional ones that you'd want to install by popularity, recency or name. You can even see the extension screenshots directly from the app. Basically, you'll never need to go to the GNOME extensions website ever again and pray for your browser extension to be installed and work so you can install them in one click. Or if you use GNOME Web and you don't have access to that feature for some reason. And let's wrap up with some gaming news. No Linux news video is complete without a Wine release, so this time we have two, Wine 7.0 and 7.1. 7.0 is a stable release with most modules converted to the PE format for better compatibility, better theming support so apps running through Wine don't look as old, and great HID and joystick support. Basically, it releases as stable all the improvements we've been seeing in Wine staging, the 6.x branch. 7.1, the next development release, is also out, and it brings Vulkan 1.3, theming fixes, and 42 bug fixes as well. We should soon see a Proton release based on that Wine 7.0 branch, so expect Proton 7. Point something dash something else in the very near future. Easy Anti Cheat is now easy to implement again for developers willing to support Proton. Valve has done the work to make sure it's as seamless as possible without any recompilation or use of the Epic Online services. It just requires developers to enable support in their EAC console and download the library and add it to their game sources followed by the publication of this new game version. Hopefully this means that developers will start taking advantage of that support, as that's not really been the case up until now. Now come on Vermintide 2, I just want to slice kill some furry rat men, yes yes! Then now I realize that if you don't know anything about Warhammer it sounded super cringy. Sorry. Lutris will soon become close to being the only launcher you'll ever need to game on Linux, as it will add both Ubisoft Connect integration and Origin integration. This means that you'll get your games from Steam, Humble Bundle, Origin, Linux Native, Ubisoft in a single unified library and get to manage all the options to run them with Wine or Proton directly from the same interface. Lutris now only lacks support for Epic Game Store and that shouldn't be that tricky because you already have the legendary library which is used by the Heroic Games Launcher. So if they can piggyback on that, it's going to be a complete experience for all the games you could ever want to play. 
Speaking of heroic, the developer added gamepad support to navigate the library. What for? Well, for the Steam Deck, for example, so you can also play your Epic Games games on the new portable device. The new release also remembers the window position and size, adds a keyboard shortcut to access search, and a new Wine Downloader feature to handle new versions of Wine and Proton GE. It also seems that the developer is working on making a Flatpak build to upload on Flathub, so it's going to be easy to install on SteamOS, but also on any other distro. And speaking of the Steam Deck, it won't be delayed again and will launch on February the 25th. Valve will send invitations to order the device that you've pre-ordered following the order in which pre-orders have arrived. And that sentence has way too many orders. People will then have 3 days or 72 hours to actually pay for the device and get it shipping to them. This means that come March, we should be able to see more Steam Deck related content everywhere, including on this very channel, as I still am in the Q1 2022 delivery window. Shipping will start on the 28th, and weekly invitations will then go out to let people order more units. My money is, is ready. Is it, is it my body? My body is ready? Maybe both. And that concludes it for this video. It was made possible by Slimbook, and this time around they are letting you get a 150 euro discount on the Slimbook Executive, which is a great ultrabook with a fantastic display, great keyboard, I reviewed it on the channel, I left a link in the description below so you can check it out. Just use this offer code at checkout if you want to benefit from that discount. And of course, supply lasts only for as long as they still have stock left, so don't dilly-dally around and just order your device right now. Now thank you guys for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, turn on notifications, and if you didn't, you can also dislike. And if you really, really like the video, you can also join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members, and you'll get access, in both cases, to my weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I cover. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!